Welcome to the Insomnia Project, the holiday episodes. Thank you for being with us all this time. For new listeners, this is kind of a little bit of a departure from our regular episodes. And for everyone who's been listening and responding, thank you for being with us during the holidays. We hope you had great holidays. Of course, New Year's is to come, and we wish you all the best for a safe, happy, happy, healthy, wonderful New Year. I'm your host, Marco Timpano. And I'm with him in Florida. I'm Amanda Barker. And Amanda, we had your father on yesterday. You sure did. And we were talking about retirement and what to do in your retirement, as well as some travel. And he had a wonderful travel story. What was that? It was about having to do dental work in Scotland. And as a result of that, I said, you also had to have dental work done on travel. So I said to our listeners that you would tell us that story. You don't know this, Marco, but I've had a lot of dental work done. Oh, over the years in various countries. Do you remember I had dental work done in Korea? No, I don't well. remember that. I think we were together at that point. I was visiting. It was after I lived in Korea when I was visiting my sister there. And uh, I have uh, veneers. I have resin veneers on my teeth. So uh, I used to chip my teeth. I have very soft teeth. So they chipped a lot uh, when I was quite a bit younger. And so when I was in my early 20s, I got resin veneers put on them just to deal with the chipping because they were so sensitive but they the the veneers themselves will crack from time to time and I have to get them filled in or figured out and uh so I went there was a time where I had one that just kept chipping kept cracking and I went to Korea and got it done and he said he didn't he didn't charge me and said it's for good luck (laughs) it's funny you and your father both both of those sort of stories are around <laughs> paying next to nothing for dental work abroad. I have my father's teeth. Okay. So it makes complete sense. Um, but the time you're referring to is when we were in Tuscany in, in, Florence, uh, in Florence, Italy. And uh, we couldn't find a dentist. And you made friends with the woman who ran the hotel. And she said, I'll give you my dentist. <laughs> It's good to make good connections. And so she called her dentist. I think his name was Alessandro. Yes, it was. And uh, anyway, and said, Alessandro will take good care of you. So we walked across the bridge, not Ponte Vecchio, but a bridge, near a bridge where, nearby right. because, you know, it's all the same river. And uh, we walked across the Arno River. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, found the. Dentist office. Dentist office on the other side of Florence. And um, <laughs> we went in and an old man, uh, a bald old man with bad breath, uh, but very nice, saw me and said, okay. And he said some things to you in Italian. And he said, basically, I think this is, I think this is a job for Alessandro. And in comes Alessandro through a sliding door in that moment. And in my memory, he had no shoes on, but he probably did have shoes on but he, he was wearing he had no socks on he had like um hush puppies with oh, no did socks he? that's that's why you're thinking that but he was very tanned he had flowing brown hair that was not quite to his shoulders but almost uh wearing all white oh, all white linen a white linen top and white linen pants and it was like he came in on a beam of light and sea breeze air like he just Floated. He was young too. He, wasn't he was old young like and other. handsome. He was very handsome. He was like the hero of a Harlequin romance novel. He he kind of looked like you know when they show you um, perfume ads that they film <laughs> in Europe, and there's someone on a boat or there's someone coming out of the water. Yeah, that's who he, he. He probably it was like he came in in black and white or something. He he just floated into the room, ciao, and. Uh, Worked on my tooth, and he he said to me, "I want to make this tooth a little different. This one, this one here, everyone will know. It is my tooth." <laughs> Amanda's mouth, her jaw dropped when he walked in the room. She couldn't believe I was he laughing. Was, she couldn't so believe hard. he was the dentist. This is a job for Alessandro. It's like yes, indeed it is. So Alessandro fixed your teeth, but he did make them imperfect because he said. Yeah. Teeth were imperfect. No, because he wanted his stamp on my mouth. 
He wanted the world to know that was Alessandro's too. Yeah, but he also said this, and I don't know if maybe he said it in Italian that maybe this is just my memory. In North America, dentists make teeth perfect. Mm-hmm. That's their goal. Mm-hmm. But he said, teeth aren't perfect, so they shouldn't look perfect. <laughs> so he even asked you, he said, do My you European want, mouth. He said, Do you want me to do it their way or my way? And I, of course, said, Alessandro, I'll do anything your way. <laughs> All this while her Marco, husband... Marco, please me, leave the room. <laughs> while I was in the room, all this was going Alessandro on. Alessandro from Florence. It was like a, every middle-aged North American woman's fantasy. Do you have a message for Alessandro or any of our listeners overseas? Yes, Alessandro. I got my teeth completely redone. Your tooth is no more, just like our love. <laughs> okay. I want to mention that one of our listeners, Colleen, Colleen Cross, mentioned that... Um, if we could talk about getting through the post-Christmas blues and the January blahs. Sure. Do you get those blues and blahs? I do. We should mention, if you're hearing dramatic music, it's because <laughs> Amanda's dad is listening to, what is it, CS watching? Well, there's every version of a show that begins with the words FBI. Apparently, there's lots of different versions of FBI TV shows. These are the things I learn when I stay at my parents. So I think he's watching FBI International. And he likes to watch it. Very loud. Very loud. So we're in Which the is amazing because my mom is trying to sleep, but And we're in the furthest room. With the, the door t- closed. <laughs> However, it's always CSI FBI's at my house. So that's what's on TV. Um what was the question? Oh, the post Christmas blues and the January blahs. I try to do two things. Last January anyway, I'll use that as an example. Every Friday I went for a walk with my friend. Um Outside, outside, whether it was sunny, snowy, it was really cold. freezing cold. I would come home and jump in the bathtub to warm up, and from the bathtub, I would order food. I would order Uber Eats, and that was like the best way to spend my last few sort of hours of Friday and enjoy whatever takeout we chose to get that day, and watch Shark Tank. Yeah, our f- and honestly, that got me through January. Our Fridays were takeout night takeout night and I made them uh my work schedule kind of lined up that I could almost always do a walk with her whether it was in the morning for lunch or best of all if I could get the afternoon off I would do like from three to four or five um sometimes we'd push it and do it Saturday morning sometimes we'd do it Thursday night uh sometimes before work on a Friday morning but I would always try to make time to go for a walk get a coffee with her And just try to see the sun if there was any sun to be seen, no matter how cold it was. Just talk and gab about the week because, you know, we wanted to just keep it airy and and not be indoors and enjoy the sun together if we could. So that's what we did. And uh, and then I'd go home knowing that I had takeout to get. How about you? Do you have any suggestions? So for me, Colleen. I discovered that playing board games was something that really helped me this year get out of my doldrums, my blahs, because it was something I remember from my childhood that I really enjoyed. So I searched back to something that I enjoyed as a child, and I brought it back to my adult life. So if there's something you enjoyed as a child, whether that be painting making puzzles, writing poetry. I'd like to get into pottery. That was something I loved as a child and I've never gotten back into it. So I think I would love to do that. And do you think if you have like a standing pottery day yeah. Thursday oh, nights, gosh, that would yeah. help you or get out of Or a Saturday morning pottery class, that would help me in my January for sure. So I'm not saying to play games or do pottery, but try to remember something you enjoyed when you were mm-hmm. young. And see if you can bring that back in some way, shape, or form. I also love books. I know it's the simplest thing in the world, but I'm on Goodreads. So Amanda has something she's trying to do before the end of the year. I I set myself a goal of reading 30 books this past year. The year before, it was 24, and that felt pretty doable to me. I did 24, so two a month. So I thought this year, 30 was a respectable goal. I have 26 read and only a few days left. So I don't know that I'll make it to 30. And I'm trying to be okay with the fact if I don't make it to 30. But I'm reading a really great book right now. So I'm just enjoying it. And 
you write your impressions of the book on this site called Goodreads, right? Yeah, and we've talked about that on this oh, podcast. Yeah, we have. But yeah, I have a I have a profile on Goodreads and do a little review and I don't know. I enjoy that connection and seeing what my friends are reading and that's kind of where I get ideas of what to read next too. You mentioned you're reading a really great book. Mm-hmm. Tell us about that book. Uh it's by author Zoe Whittall. Uh, She's a wonderful author. I really love her writing. I find her just so readable and enjoyable and relatable um, for me anyway. Uh, So I'm reading her most recent novel, which is called The Spectacular. It takes place in the 1990s, uh, a decade I'm very fond of. And uh, so it's the story of a mother and daughter, and it's sort of from each of their perspectives kind of unraveling, and it's really enjoyable and really fun read so far. I find her books both fun and poignant. Uh, They sort of have a nice mix for me. So I really enjoy her writing. I was listening to the audiobook version of Mm. this particular book, The Spectacular. Mm -hmm. And what I notice about her writing is it just feels so natural. It's like you're, it, 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 it immerses you into the story because it is, it feels so natural and it doesn't use extra words. I don't know how you describe that. Yeah. You know, it's very, con- not concise, but it's very thoughtful. I don't know. I it's feel very like thoughtful. I, Husbandry yeah. of words, for sure. I just find it very relatable, like I'm speaking to a friend. This is the fourth novel I've read by her. And everyone has a different version of what they would call a quote-unquote beach read. Right. And actually, I find sometimes we need those beach reads in the winter. Like in January, that's when I really need them. That's another great way to be, to to fight the January blast, yeah. is read beach reads in the yeah. winter. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And this one, one of the characters is on tour throughout the United States, which I've talked about it many times. I was on tour personally in the United States, so I'm kind of reliving that a little bit. Um, and... Uh, Although I was on tour with the show, this is a band, but similar right. ideas of waking up in hotels and cities and so on. So, yeah, I uh, I just really find, like I said, the, uh, the first book I ever read of hers, I grabbed at the airport before our honeymoon, Marco, yes, 11 years ago. And I loved that book so much. I got another one of her books out from the library. And then I bought uh, her third novel, which I absolutely love that novel. Which one's that one? The Best Kind of People. Yeah. And there's actually one of the characters in it. I've already told my agent and flagged with who I would assume would be casting it. That's how much research I've done. Uh, And I have my reasons, but I'll leave. Anyway, the person I assume will be casting it, I've already said to him, I just want to be seen for this role. You want to audition for it? Yeah, it's not even a big role, but... Are you able to... Do you feel comfortable saying what the role is? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the school secretary, which is the type of role I often play sure. so it's certainly in my wheelhouse House. um but she's uh fighting for men's rights and uh it's such a the best kind of people it's such a poignant book oh it's so good her writing's great and well, she's and she's funny too she writes for baroness von sketch show which is such an amazing sketch show she she writes for Shit's creek or did anyway um she's a talent that you'll hear if you haven't i've heard. never actually met her but we have many many mutual friends Um, So I feel like we're in each other's sort of outer orbit, which is kind of the fun part of being an artist in Toronto. And her books are about that, about being artists in in Toronto and Montreal. I think she was originally Quebec-based. So I, I, I have a love for authors who write books that take place in this in our city mm, mm-hmm. and they don't feel the need to mask it with chicago or some other place and, for sure and uh if you haven't heard of zoe Whittall um at this point trust me you will you will know her in the future yeah because- and if you want a good toronto book since we're on a zoe Whittall uh bender here mm. um the first book i read by her which was called Holding Still for as long as possible. Is that the one you read on our honeymoon? Yeah, okay. and it took one of the things I loved about it was it took place in Toronto and it was right. very Toronto specific, which I loved. Then I went on to read her first novel, I believe it was anyway, uh, which is called Bottle Rocket Hearts. Yes, very well known book, uh, which takes place in Montreal. Um, and the coolest uh, jacket cover of a book. Yeah, and I, yeah. my memory—it's been a while since I read that book, but my memory is it takes place. 
in Quebec, like during Meech Lake, like during that time. That time. I think yeah. I've got that right. It's been a while. And then Best Kind of People, I believe, takes place in Connecticut, I think. And uh, and again, I'm a New Englander, so. There you go. And then this one uh, sort of takes place all over, but uh, there's Vancouver, um, I think. There's uh, actually the Eastern Townships. Where, of Quebec, yeah. some Vermont in there, which is, of course, nearby. And like I said, all over the United States. And you haven't so. finished the book, so it could No, take I'm a, only about 100 pages yeah. in, so who knows where it'll take me. I, maybe I imagine Vancouver, but I feel like some of it's Vancouver. I Can I talk about the book I took yeah, yeah. on our honeymoon, our Please. beach read? So Amanda had that book. That's the couch. When you lean back, it makes Sorry. that noise. It's okay. So Amanda had that book as her beach read, and I did not bring a book with us on our honeymoon. And so... I picked one up from the resort that that was there when we oh were there. Oh my god, what did you read? I don't remember. I, I barely up remember. A Cowboy for Christmas, which was a, <laughs> a Harlequin romance. A Cowboy novel. for Christmas. And I thought it was a great title. I thought I it was forgot. I thought it was funny <laughs> for many reasons because one, it was May. This is so, 11 years ago. Yeah, it was May and I was reading this Christmas book. Two, it was a Harlequin romance that I was reading on the beach. And you were a bit embarrassed, and that made me want to read it more. Because she's like, are you really going to read that? I'm like, yes, I'm going to read it. And I read this book called <laughs> A Cowboy for Christmas. I'll tell you this. It's a very easy read to read a Harlequin romance. Like, they're not difficult reads. I mean, sure. If you want to get to 30, 30 books by the end of the year, you would just yeah. have to read a few Harlequin well, I think romances. My mom, has, my mom is a Nora Roberts person, so there's a lot of Nora no, Roberts No, but Nora here. Roberts wrote big books okay well harlequin romances are quick listen, so we're literally in my parents library surrounded by books right now and yes uh, my parents have a library and colleen just to answer your question i would say read a harlequin romance that takes place in the summertime so maybe like a what would be the opposite of a cowboy like a um a school teacher in summer and that would be <laughs> well it would be like love on the beach right you know who it. writes, apparently, and actually I really would like to read them, Sunny Hostin has a couple of oh, different... Oh, I should have bought that for you for Christmas. Well, I didn't think. next Christmas. I didn't think. Sunny Hostin, who you might know from The View or CNN, I mean, she's an amazing journalist and lawyer, um, and also novelist. So she, we've, we've actually listened to her audiobook, which is great, but she's written um because she's such a passionate reader and writer she's written i think a few now uh, maybe two um books that take place like in martha's vineyard cape cod and they're sort of fun summery romances and uh, yeah you know what i think i'm gonna commit my january to summery romance books and you know she and those books are being made into uh movies oh, are or, they really yeah oh, or, I didn't or television that. series yeah kind of nick's oh, almost sounds like a nicholas sparks kind of thing but i'm not oh, sure i don't know what nicholas sparks is you know, it's he's a soldier, and he comes home. She's she, they went to high school together, mm -hmm. and it's the beaches of South Carolina. And, okay, or she has a checkered past, but really she loves him. Like they're they're kind of like, like um like a Harlequin movie. Okay, what, Harlequin movie is that what's called? No, no, Hallmark movie. A Hallmark movie. Okay, with like an edge. Right, a little bit, but like a little bit of. I edge. think I think Sonny Hostin's books are probably. They probably are. are. I better, just haven't are read better them. better than a Hallmark movie. I hear no, they're great. I'm saying Nicholas Sparks, who's oh, okay. well known and well loved. I, Is he an author? I, yes. Okay. And his sorry. books are made into movies, and they're like Hallmark movies with an edge. And I say that lovingly. I didn't know. I thought maybe it was a character like John Wick or like no Nicholas the Born Sparks. Identity. Remember, we we watched one once, I think, and it was like Julianne Hough was the lead, and it was like she had a past where she. That Her husband drank. Parton. That was the Dolly Parton thing. She no, did. there's a Nick. Anyway, it okay. doesn't matter. And it's like, how will she ever? How, will he love her despite her past? The answer is always yes. But okay. anyways, but they're like legit movies. Like they're on TV. Like I doubt they're I would, in the theater. I doubt I would have watched this type of a film. I think you and I went and saw a Julianne Huff movie. No. Okay, it wasn't maybe it was me. my mom. It was a few years ago. Why would I go watch this kind of a movie? You know the kind of movies I like to watch. Nicholas Sparks movies. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, they have an edge. You know, he's working the boat dock in South Carolina. And, you know, she's a single mom. This sounds like will the, they find love? This yes, like they the, always will. This sounds like The Notebook. Is that what The Notebook was the about? The Notebook is a good movie. Don't oh, you it? start with The Notebook. 
It sounds like that. Wasn't he Have a you even seen the notebook? No, I haven't. Well, then don't make that face. I'm not making a face. You're making a notebook face. Okay, well, listen. I You're could saying be every all of these movies are garbage, but Sonny Hostins are amazing. I think Sonny Hostins are amazing and these movies are amazing. I'm not saying these movies are garbage. I don't know this Bill Blass you have, movie. Who? Who is it? Bill, Bill Blass. <laughs> The designer from the eighties. I don't know what's the guy's name. Did you just say Bill? Bill Blass. Nicholas Sparks. Nicholas Sparks. Marco, you need to do a deep Nicholas Sparks dive. How about Jody Picoult? Do you know her? Oh yes, I love her book. She wrote the Shipping News. Okay, well there you go. And I read the Shipping News, and the Shipping News was excellent. Okay, well think that, but more love story. Okay. I don't know. I haven't read them, but this is. I'll tell you this: the Shipping News, the book was amazing. The movie was okay. All right. I will say this, though. If you're ever going to watch a movie with Amanda and her folks, you're never truly going to watch the movie. Okay, this is getting fun. Well, I tried to watch a movie with you guys yesterday. You know how it is, Marco. (laughs) No, it's an interactive experience, an an immersive interactive experience. Like the the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids ride at Disney or whatever that is where they, you know, there's a lot of discussion. We tried to watch Being the Ricardos. Which was a good movie. Which, from what I saw, was a good movie. Oh, would you stop? A lot of it is Amanda and her mother. It's an interactive experience. Talking about the actors who are in the movie, what other films There was a lot in. of discussion about Linda Lavin. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it there. Linda Lavin was in the movie. It's in the, it's in the movie. <laughs> and Amanda's mother asked, is that Linda Lavin? And then your dad said, no, it's... The, the person she was playing. Which happened to be written under her name. Yeah, because she was playing a writer. For Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. And about every... Because they made it kind of like a mockumentary. It was confused. Or a documentary. So. Every 22 minutes, your mother, mom kept saying, she looks so much like Linda <laughs> Lavin. <laughs> and at a certain point, I said, that's... And I'm trying to watch the movie. And I'm literally <laughs> two feet away from the television set. But I cannot hear it. Because there's a lot of Liv- Linda Lavin talk. <laughs> and P.S. Linda Lavin is amazing she, in everything she, she does. She's a big part Linda, of that movie. But Linda Lavin is amazing in everything what she does. What was she in? She was in Alice. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. I loved her in Alice. Yeah, she's Kiss great. my grits. And she yeah. was also in other things, but she's great in everything. Yeah. Anyways, at a certain point, I say to your mother, it is Linda <laughs> Lavin thinking it'll end the conversation. No, it just sparked more conversation. <laughs> and at the very end, my mom's like, I thought it was. Well, why did he say it was somebody else? I'm like, because it says somebody else's name. Under her, that's the character she's playing. We're, we're not giving any spoilers, by the way. And we're just talking about at the Linda end, Lavin. Yeah, which really has very little to do with that movie. And at the very end, my dad goes, hey, that was Linda Lavin. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, we established that. And we were watching this at home. but when, And it's fine when but, we're in a home. But let me talk about movie experiences when we're not at home with my mom are often the same. At the movie theater. Yep. And I I get embarrassed. So I try to sit the furthest away from Welcome your mom. Welcome to my whole life. Because your mom is so loud. <laughs> and everyone turns to look at us. And so if I'm further away, I can sort of the best, detach the myself. The best was many years ago, I took my parents to Stratford to see the show The Scarlet Pimpernel. And just to set the scene, Stratford is a town in Ontario that is well known for putting on Grand production, right? Because it's like Stratford upon Avon. They play on that it's birth of William Shakespeare. Great theater, and uh, so not only it, do they do Shakespeare, but they do musicals, and they'll usually do period piece. And some of the best actors have performed at yeah. Stratford: so Christopher this, Plummer, William Shatner. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the woman, Andrew Martin. Anyway, the woman from Downton Abbey, the old woman. What's her name again? Dan, Maggie, Dan, Maggie. Maggie Smith. Smith. Yeah. Sure. Anyway, the point is, this wasn't Shakespeare. It was a, like a restoration piece. I forget who wrote The Scarlet Pimpernel, but it's a pretty famous one that you study in like theater school. Anyway, it's kind of long. But so I take my parents and the end of the first act, and I'm really not giving much away, this one of the main characters, no one's looking and he takes the red scarf, the Scarlet Pimpernel, I guess Pimpernel is the word for scarf. Anyways, he takes it out and you see him just sort of take it out, look around and like tuck it in his, you know, sleeve or whatever. And that's the end of the first act, the reveal of who the Scarlet Pimpernel is. <laughs> Intermission. 15 minutes into the second act, my mom says as loud as can be, oh, he's the Scarlet Pimpernel. 
<laughs> like she hears. figured it out 15 minutes through the second act, even though that was the reveal at the end of the first act, to which I said, mom, that they, they showed that at the end of the first act. She said, well, I didn't care. I wasn't paying attention. One of the Are things, you looking up who wrote the Scarlet no, Pimpernel? No, no. One of the things Doesn't matter. that it's... your parents love to do, <laughs> and I don't know why they take great pleasure in this, but they do, is we'll watch a movie that takes place in Massachusetts, in Boston. Yeah. And as we're watching, as I'm trying to watch the movie, both of your parents will loudly tell me whose accent, whose Bostonian accent is accurate and why. And whose isn't. So I usually miss the first 15 minutes of of the plot. Which, by the way, they don't mind going to the theater, not that we've been in a long time, but they don't mind going to the theater and missing the first 15 minutes of the movie also. They will tell you, don't worry, there's at least 20 minutes of previews. Don't worry. And we miss. And we get in and we've missed some of the movie because my mom has tried to jam in a few more errands before we get to the theater. But the apple doesn't fall far from the tree because... When you and I go to the movies, doesn't matter if we get there right on time, you will always have to stand in line to get popcorn. I enjoy popcorn. And same with your mother. We're 15 minutes late to the movie, but we're all standing in line to get popcorn. Okay, Marco. Well, the good news is I haven't been to a movie in over okay. two years, okay. so you can, but I I'm think, drop saying, it. I'm just saying. It's Marco, something. I'm the Scarlet Pimpernel. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know it's... <laughs> I've no, no. I need to. I don't have my. I need to look up who wrote Here, the Scarlet Pimpernel. I, I know. I it sounds like I'm saying slagging your parents. Yeah, it but def- I'm not it, because it, you are. No, because I do. Now I do enjoy going to the movies and watching movies. Just with your know parents. what you're in for. That's what I say. Just don't see a movie that you really want to like hear all the words to. And I was fine with being the Car- Ricardos because I wasn't. I wasn't so. So it was good. It, you know, it was you know, good. It yeah. wasn't. Listen, it blow me away. I enjoyed it. Good enough. I enjoyed it. Uh, Baroness Orsky? No, that's who it's about. Who, wrote, who wrote the book? Baroness or- Oh, I guess. Orsky. It. Okay. I thought it was um the guy that wrote the Bow Stratagem, George Farquhart or something. Was it Bill Blass? What's the guy's name again? <laughs> yeah. It was um, Nicholas Sparks. Wrote- <laughs> right. It well, was, he was the, Baroness Orsky was the Nicholas Sparks of her generation. Well, listen, thank you for. Or the Sonny Hostin of her generation. Thank you for joining us on this journey through <laughs> the winter blahs. <laughs> and I, I, Colleen, I hope I was able to give you some, some help there. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us. We are not in a recording studio, obviously. <laughs> We're in Amanda's parents' library, which is not that far from where her par- her dad it is. It makes my house sound like it's a palatial manor, and please know it is not. It just books are very important to my parents, so, yeah, so they devoted, you know, a room to them. this. Would be the spare a spare room? Yeah, like this well, would be a bedroom. It, right? It's you know they live here. And it's a three bedroom house, so one of the bedrooms is the library. Right. That's all. And your dad is just blasting CSI, FBI, or whatever yeah. it is. It's a very open Floridian house, so all the doors open out to the world so everything's connected everything's one level there's no stairs here it's all one level house so we all share each other's noise well thank you for sharing our noise today (laughs) on this episode of the insomnia project we hope you were able to listen enjoy maybe laugh and hopefully even sleep the good news is my dad just shut all the noise off now that we're done (laughs) 